be inspired by classics texts in discussion with fellow engaged readers. Be transformed through unique lifelong learning seminars. This July, read deeply with summer classics at St. John's College, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Visit sjc.edu slash summer classics. Hey, it's Violet. Before we dive into today's show, I've got a quick favor to ask. We have a survey up on our website, harpers.org slash survey. Would you please take it? It shouldn't take more than five minutes to complete. As we approach five years of the podcast, we have been discussing ways to make the show even better. That's why it's crucial we hear from you. The survey's up at harpers.org slash survey. Thank you in advance for lending your voice. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the Harper's Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Luca. In the May issue, Hari Kunzru and Eric Baker each probe popular narratives around work. That nobody wants to work, that office workers are quietly quitting at unprecedented rates, that automation will imminently replace humans, or, conversely, that workers' rights are flourishing. None of these, even the ones you might want to be true, are backed up by statistics. The rate of resignations has been steadily rising in the U.S. for years, but not among the laptop class. It's people in low-wage service jobs who continue to jockey for higher, steadier pay. The real crisis of work arises from the fact that, in this economy, it's become obvious that fulfilling yourself through hard work, let alone climbing the income ladder, is a fantasy. The same could be said of highly publicized AI tools. After the collapse of cryptocurrencies and foundering of social media, why should we put any faith in Silicon Valley? I spoke with Kunzru and Baker about their pieces, the culture and history of work, technology's true impact on employment, the invisibility of so-called low-skill jobs, and the ideological collapses we face in all areas of our lives. Both of you reveal what feeble and imprecise terms we use to describe work. You know, you're both talking about service work, which covers everything except mining, construction, manufacturing, or agriculture. It makes up 80% of the workforce. Service. That's a huge category. Um, and I have my own thoughts about why we lack this vocabulary, but where do you feel it comes from, this, this, this very outdated, old category? Well, yeah, so I think there are kind of two answers uh, to this question. On the one hand, there's the sort of genealogy of the term and the, the kind of path dependency that explains its persistence. So on the one hand, it is, it is a kind of hangover from this moment in the, in the early 20th century where um, the, the service sector began to expand um, really ancillary to the manufacturing sector. I mean, one of the, one of the major early service sectors was uh, literally car servicing. Um, a lot of mm -hmm. people were employed in various jobs, you know, as, as the, the auto industry began to expand in the 1910s and 1920s. There was a, a rash of new jobs and you know, gas station attendants. Uh, there used to be a lot of people employed in this job. There still are in, in some states. Um, you know, m mechanics, repairs. So people literally servicing uh, manufactured objects. Uh, and then on the other hand, um, there were the, the so-called professional services. Um, again, services that, that, that people were performing uh, to, to kind of lubricate the the gears of the the corporate economy. Um, so you get this kind of tripartite vision. Well, it used to be that everyone was farmers, and then there was a big shift into to manufacturing. And now uh, there's the growth in, in all these industries that seem kind of parasitic on on the this kind of core industrial sector. That kind of tr trinity of... Um, agriculture industry and, and service uh, comes into into being in the early 20th century and, and has a certain kind of rationality then what happens is that the the share of employment in 
that industrial manufacturing sector not only stagnates, but continues to decline. Um, and you get a whole variety of uh, other you know, new sectors that are kind of slotted into the services bin because that's where that's where they 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 seem to fit you know more naturally than into either of the other two. Um, even though it's not you know it's 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 not quite clear um, the applicability of of the the concept is um, is quite different. But I think that there's also another factor which helps to explain the the persistence, which is just our kind of cultural penchant for euphemism and and talking about work. Um, I mean, a lot of what I think the service category does now, um, as I think Hari's piece draws out well, is is to to kind of smooth over the enduring, you know, kind of cl- class structure of this of this domain. I mean, it's 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 not clear. You know, you could say that, you know, lawyers are performing a service and Uber drivers are performing a service, uh, but you know, cl- clearly there's a, a kind of act of obfuscation there. Why is that? actually happening i mean it's very interesting to me i mean i can i can imagine there might be ideological reasons for doing that as seems to be what you're hinting but it seems to reduce the value of the term to to the point where it does seem to obfuscate more than it actually elucidates yeah i think that that's and increasingly it's hard you know to use this this term with a with a straight face i feel like people when i hear people talk about the service work or the the service sector it's often with the kind of invisible scare quotes yeah i mean what do you think of i mean newer terms like knowledge worker or you know effective labor and things like that that seem to have a a, a more kind of precise handle on uh the kinds of work that we're talking about i think that there's you know certainly utility in in precision uh i guess the the question that I always have about these neologisms is um, they seem to be kind of attached to, always kind of attached to some kind of theory. Uh, it, it's it's hard not to, sure. It's hard not to be teleological in, in talking about this stuff. Um, you know, is there, you know, if, if the if the new big thing is is affective labor, for example, um, you know, the the baggage that seems to often come with this is the sense that. You know, there's some kind of inevitable, you know, evolution of, of capitalism, you know, towards the valorization of, of effective work. And I'm, I'm uh, a little less convinced. Of that. Or the enclosure of effective yeah. work into a kind of formal capital yeah. structure. I suppose. And that's clearly a phenomenon, you know. Um, but, I mean, you, you think on a global scale, the number of people who are still employed, I mean, not, not just in manufacturing, but in agriculture is still enormous. And so I think that the, it's, it's important to avoid this the kind of like stagist view that we sometimes have um, where, you know, yeah, there, was, sure. there used to be in this era, this was the work that people did. And then in the next era, people did a different kind of work. And now we, whoever that is, like do another kind of work. Right. Eric, your piece, you, you sort of go through the history of different phases of work in America, right? That, you know, there was uh, this agricultural era, there was this industrialization era, there was deindustrialization. Now we're in whatever the hell era we are in where there is this crisis of work, but you identify that we're guided by this idea of the entrepreneurial work ethic and that work is only as meaningful as it embodies the personality of the individual. And so you got to work hard and make meaning through your labor. I mean, does this need to actualize, speak to the specifics of the American character, or, or is it something deeper about humanity? I mean, you, you discuss Maslow, but he was an American psychologist after all. To me, the, the proof is kind of in the pudding here. I mean, the, this idea what I call the entrepreneurial work ethic has really been exported uh, and it's been exported for a long time um, in the 1950s and 1960s as part of all kinds of you know, de- development initiatives that the American foundation world um, embarked on you know, as, as an antidote to communism and the, the post-colonial world. There were, there were a lot of, of efforts to kind of seed entrepreneurialism, do workshops with local business leaders to, to get them to, to become more more entrepreneurial. And if you travel to 
you know, a, any place with a, a kind of nascent, you know, a, a sense of itself as, as developing, in, industrializing, mm. modernizing. Um, I, I do think that the, the culture of entrepreneurialism increasingly, you know, seems to seems to come with it. So from my perspective, it's it's less about the the American character and, you know, with all due respect to, to Maslow, even less about kind of essential human nature um, and, and more about this this process that I described where when when work becomes scarce, uh, but it's still something that you have to do to make a living, you know, this this creates demands on on the individual. And uh, in, in order to, to kind of celebrate or, or kind of come put, put a, almost put a positive spin on this sort of hyper competitive reality where people are, are scrabbling, you know, for for work itself, the, I think that the ideological resources of entrepreneurialism are uh, are very useful in, in any national context. I mean, I, I think the ideas about self-actualization, I mean, not just Maslow, but that whole uh, culture that came out of, I mean, let's say the West Coast in, uh, in the 50s and 60s has fed into in ways that are kind of complicated and I'm sure we could debate forever a kind of neoliberal notion of selfhood and the entrepreneurial self mm. I mean I quite like the I mean Foucault in some, some of the late Collège de France lectures uh, uses the term épreuve uh, this kind of idea of testing that the self must be kind of tested against the the exigencies of the market or the kind of environment in some way and uh, and thus the kind of a sort of cycle of improvement and honing kind of takes place and there's a there's certainly that sort of language in the what you call the culture of uh, entrepreneurship and uh, and that seems to offer um it seems to offer rewards in terms of identity you know you think of yourself as striving for some sort of self-actualization through your your labor and it also kind of uh, fits the subject to exist in a, a kind of competitive and deregulated environment where you would be uh, not expecting certain sorts of social solidarity or certain sorts of support. You're supposed to be, you know, self-optimizing in order to compete in the most uh, efficient way. Yeah, I think that that's a a great a great point. That so much of w- one way to to frame this kind of cultural transformation. I do think that it's a, a fundamental kind of anthropological <laughs> principle that you know who who you are has something to do with what you do in the most abstract sense. Mm. Um, the, the question is, is, you know, what is, what is it that, that you do? And uh, I think that the part of one way to kind of narrate the, the advent of, of neoliberalism is, is the, the gradual kind of evisceration of these of spheres of activity outside of work, the, the kind of subordination of, of uh, activity uh, to work so that the, the the distinction between doing and working is increasingly uh, often blurred or, or hard to define precisely. So um, in that case, it does make sense why you know people who naturally kind of think about their, themselves, their identity in terms of the action that they take in the world that gets con- conflated with their work because other sorts of spheres where um, that kind of self-definition may have transpired increasingly either converted into a form of work, you know, in a kind of careerist way or, you know, just don't exist. There's also the very practical thing about the kind of temporal blurring that happens. Now we, you know, we have devices that are always with us and and the kind of the idea of the eight hour work day or whatever is just simply doesn't actually address the ways that a lot of, uh, I suppose, especially what you'd call professional service work now uh takes place you know i mean violet you were you know you were sending us email at ten thirty <laughs> last night from home so you know that's a that's a you know you were you were at home but you were also working and presumably you were multitasking in various you know yes. ways like this this uh this kind of blurring of work and life is is a is, is very much to do with time and the uh, and the kind of designations that we give to time. Yeah, it makes me think of Jonathan Crary's great book Twenty Four Seven, which explicates exactly this this kind of 
really a dream. I mean, the, there's there's a lot of enthusiasm, as he shows in that, that book, a lot of kind of aspiration, you know, for, you know, corporate executives and um, even, you know, the, there's sort of very sinister anecdotes about kind of military initiatives, the, the creation of a, a sort of 24-7 consciousness. I mean, this this is the, the kind of ultimate triumph over the, the kind of fundamental barrier to you know, at the at the end of the day, people people can't work. Um, people can't work forever. There are only twenty four hours in a day. This is the kind of fundamental limit for accumulation. Um, but uh, yes. increasingly, we're running up against that limit. Yeah, I mean, I also think of the gig economy, which originally started. So Uber started as, well, you're driving anyway, so why not make a little money while you drive? And then it becomes all you do and the 40 hour work week is completely destroyed and you're driving just to uh survive that these technologies these these like fun little ideas become someone's entire life and then if you're an uber driver there's an expectation about how you how you behave you know you're getting a rating the driver has to figure out does the passenger want to talk and if he talks too much, it's bad. If he doesn't talk enough, it's bad. Uh, the barista has to not only get your order right, but to smile, kind of do this performance. There's all these little things in service work, in the gig economy, you have to perform, but also kind of erase your actual self in a way that's really it's unsettling i mean i think it is important that we now have we now have uh these technologies which are which allow a very kind of real-time cybernetic monitoring of of both the the worker and the customer in those sort of relationships you know it's not just the driver who gets a a star rating from the, the the ride hail company it's the it's the passenger too so there's a sort of social credit aspect to all this yeah. that is uh let's say interesting and we are at a moment where it's vastly profitable for things to be metricated and the aggregation of large amounts of data and the ability to kind of use that to to predict behavior and to nudge behavior in particular directions is 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 part of the sort of deep functioning of power now um and so you know there is this kind of anxiety about performance in that there are just techniques to monitor performance in a way that there just weren't before you know the dream of taylorism of a kind of rational uh uh kind of simplification of the workplace you know the, the worker performs the the correct movement in the most efficient way is now i suppose extended to a sort of emotional or you know affective domain in that uh you know when we fall short in terms of attention or focus or cheerfulness or all these other things it's possible for that to be captured and uh and for us to be nudged back on course so so this whole business about performance which again comes back to to the to work as a kind of test or a sort of uh, a striving a kind of quasi sporting thing um you know we we are uh we're always on and we're always performing and we're always you know potentially being graded on that performance and i do think that that helps to explain the kind of sense of exhaustion that um, a lot of people describe in relation to their work yes, today yes absolutely uh, it's it's totally affectively depleting uh and it also requires i mean per- performance evokes a, a you know, kind of artistic metaphor. Um, you, know, you you perform. There's there's some kind of standard, real standard of excellence. Um, you know, but it, it, increasingly, that's it's not the it's not the case. Uh, or at the very least, it's the the standard is, you know, clear, more arbitrary or, or clearly just in the the surface of kind of product uh, profit maximization, um, which which makes it I think a bit harder to buy in. You know, you're you're. It's it's one thing to sort of drive yourself to you know perform uh, as a as a ballet dancer, but uh, to to drive yourself to perform um, in a, a very kind of repetitive customer service job, um, it's uh, I, 
it's a different kind of proposition. Yeah, there's some there's been some discussion about emotional labor in different types of work. Um, but do you feel like shaking off the depersonalized aspects of these roles would help them make would help make these jobs more visible because again uh the the real the the people who are actually experiencing the crisis of work supposedly are not the laptop class they're they're service workers they are people who who with low income jobs who are quitting and trying to find something else that will get them slightly more money like it's this weird uh, they're in the marketplace in this really aggressive, and they're they're in an aggressive marketplace where they are trying to, trying to just get by. And and so much of the writing on the crisis of work doesn't touch on that. You know, it's it's you know people who work in an office who want to spend more time with their kids or something. It's it's this romanticized view of who is actually being impacted by this crisis. Yeah. I it's the the question of visibility and and invisibility is i think often a difficult one to assess i mean i i, I do think that it's it's true that discourse on work um there i mean our our language for several centuries has has drawn this distinction between work and labor uh where work you know has a has a kind of dignity to it um as opposed to labor which is a you know more kind of drudgery uh, Adam's curse and whatnot, and I do think one implication of that is when when people in media talk about work, they they often uh, tend to to focus on on people whose whose labor they they imagine to be more more dignified or more fulfilling or something, which typically means professionals as opposed to um, lower wage workers. The question of whether if there was less you know surveillance or you know, more more kind of humanized work environment, if that would make people more visible, I, I think that it almost gets the, the causality wrong. I, I think the reason why these kinds of systems of surveillance and standardization and, and control uh, flourish is is because there's a, a real kind of economic necessity uh, that's, that's bound up in um, a system of production for profit and, and consumption on the market. So I think that the, you know, again, the what's what's fascinating is, is precisely this way that a certain kind of performance of humanity and, and individuality is is that's actually what's kind of the golden ticket. That's what the all the the ingenuity of our sort of management experts is is going to try to elicit the standardization, the dehumanization that that comes quite naturally. Uh, so it's what what really requires some some cleverness is 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 trying to to produce this kind of appearance of of you know personhood that that makes it it easier you know I think for for everyone to discharge their their roles in the system. I mean, this does speak to the 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 question of of crisis and and you know I I become very interested in in the this sort of disjuncture between the the rhetoric about automation and you know a kind of massive m- multiplication of the forces of production and productivity is going to go through the roof because we have automation and you know we're me- we're many years into the the digital revolution and the promised increases in production haven't happened so there's a kind of sense that a lot of this workplace surveillance is and the kind of the the quest to squeeze that extra bit of productivity out of each worker is because there the new technologies don't seem to be producing uh you know increasing our productivity in a in a natural way there's a kind of anxiety about that as well everything seems to be changing but what's really uh yeah you know, improving for for people which i think it goes to the heart of you know what i adopt the concept of legitimation crisis to describe this kind of sense of yes. disillusionment. I mean, there's, you know, again, there was a, a famous article a, a few decades ago, Paul Krugman famously averred that it would be easier to detect the, the introduction of the fax machine and the productivity statistics than the introduction of the <laughs> internet. Um, and he was widely mocked uh, and and has been widely mocked subsequently. But I think that in, increasingly people are, are, 
you know, sort of sympathetic to that view, you know, maybe they don't know the, the full econometric uh, context or whatever, but it, in, intuitively, I, I, I think that there is a, a sense, you know, the, the, the future that the internet promised several decades ago has, has not really arrived in, in the way that people thought it would. The flying cars problem. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, we're in this interesting moment with the uh, the various sort of AI systems that have have uh, recently been launched, and there's a you know w- we're seeing yet another run of the uh, you know this changes everything. Our productivity uh, is going to be multiplied by this new technology, and uh, already you know. A, a, a quite short time in we're kind of beginning to detect a real gap between the uh pr and the actual uh functioning of these of these systems yes. i mean there's certainly uh, there's certainly going to be uh, areas where they do when their automation is successfully achieved in in areas that wasn't uh possible before but the um, I'm very interested in the kind of the ideology of the AI hype is a, is a fascinating uh, thing to think about, and it's it's something that's that's proceeded in in cycles. I mean, this is a, a theme of yes. um, of my essays. The way that the is um, there, there's this kind of uncanny cyclical element to the kind of re- reinvention of the of the next big thing, um, and and and, and Conversely, you know, f- the reinvention of fears of, of what the next big thing will do. Um, and, and, you know, often what happens is in, instead of, you know, ushering in a, a total brave new world, you know, it's, it, it, it sort of leads to a, a, new, a new present, a new version of the present um, with, you know, relations of, of power basically unchanged. You know, most, most people's absolutely intact i mean the i mean if we look at the at the incredibly rapid cycle of, of blockchain technology the you know the promise of decentralization and democratization um you know quickly became a kind of incredible concentration of holdings in the in cryptocurrencies mm-hmm. you know the usual suspects just had the new financial instruments and the power relations were the same despite the uh the rhetoric about you know decentralization and so on and then because you know i mean i think what at this point we have to call the abject failure of uh of blockchain technology to to really i don't know find any kind of real world use cases at all other than burning a lot of energy to to make some new tokens for trading um you know we we, we know we've we've watched this cycle play out in the course of about two or three years and then hard on its heels we have the ai cycle and it's as if you know the sort of uh the tumbleweeds are blowing through web three yeah. right now i mean whether you know i mean where the blockchain will find some because it is an interesting technology yeah. but it just is not it, it was not the thing that that it was being claimed to be kind of, with the, with the, uh, a few years yeah. ago with the ai hype there there seems to me, especially with the 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 interest in in ChatGPT and these these language models, uh, there seems to me to be almost kind of something else lurking in the in the background. Um, it's a kind of guilty consciousness, I think, about the 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 inadequacies of the the so called creative economy. Um, you know, you 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 go back. Uh, 20 years, you have Richard Florida mm-hmm. announcing the, the dawn of the creative class. There's a real kind of conflation of um, professional work, so-called white-collar work, uh, with creative work. And, and that was um, such a dominant ideology of, of work in the, the early 21st century. Um, to me, there, there's something very sad about the, the fear that, that one one's job, you know, might be once, you know, supposedly creative job might be taken um, by by AI. I think that if people felt, if people really believed that what they were, that what they were doing um, in their professional jobs was kind of authentically creative, then, then these, these anxieties would be, would be less pronounced. Um, but there's a, almost a kind of disclosure of the, the awareness of the, the kind of basic, basically repetitive mechanical 
in the nature of a lot of what this has ended up amounting to. I mean, it's it's also been very interesting in terms of uh, you know the the, dis the discourse around automation. You know, up to late last year, were, uh, by and large, assumed that the kind of work that would be automated would be, you know, I mean, we think of you know a robot making something in a factory, mm -hmm. like it would be this kind of uh, repetitive, low status labor that would be automated, and then suddenly the you know, they came for the illustrators <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's a kind of work that was very strongly uh, identified with this self-actualization, with this question of creativity, which has, I completely agree, metastasized through the, 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 the way we think and talk about work. So, uh, you know, uh, sort of bolting on a, a kind of I don't know, a rhetorical component of creativity to most or to all sorts of different jobs has been a, has been a feature of, of how we talk about work in the last 20 years. But I, I mean, what I'm saying is that, is that I think this kind of the, the way that the, the new AIs seem to be targeting very specifically creative labor language. I mean, music, you know, this week we've had the, the Drake and Weekend fake collaboration produced entirely by yes. ai which is completely freaking out the the record companies i mean they're, they're take, trying to take it off the internet as quickly as uh, people are putting it but up it sucks um <laughs> that's a problem it's, not, it's quite it's quite i didn't like it <laughs> i mean what sucks you didn't like this you didn't like that particular I didn't song like the i mean music. But, you know the idea <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. Choose, choose your singer. Choose your fighter. <laughs> yeah. They'll, 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 uh, they'll have one, have one for you. I mean, I'm sure, like the karaoke machines, in five years' time, you'll be able to kind of uh, sing your Bob Dylan song as Bob Dylan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is the and the, the the question. Yeah, the the AI produced stuff sucks. So the question is, you know, does it suck more than the kind of commodities of the, the, the culture industry uh as it already is. absolutely yeah there you go um, you know because that's that's the ambition you know it's it's not like the you know sure you know you can't if you type i, I don't even know how these systems work you know if, if you you ask uh you know chat gpt to you know produce a i don't know a, a, a film for you you know it's it's not going to give you you know, Tokyo Story or Citizen Kane or whatever, but, you know, it's not like those those films are, you know, <laughs> those are the kinds of films that are, are making money. Um, you know, there's already is a kind of... I mean, have you seen, there's there's this 24-hour Seinfeld that's yeah, running at yeah. the moment. There's a, yeah, I mean, those, those kind of highly formulaic yeah. things are the low-hanging fruit for, for these systems because if there's a if there's a pattern and a set of content that can be run through the pattern, then, you know, then that's, uh, uh, that's where they will be able to function quite well. I mean, it's in the same way that the kind of, you know, if your job as a paralegal is producing certain sorts of form letters, which always have the same, uh, structure and the content is just the changes is just the, you know, essentially kind of names and details, then that's, clearly work that can be done for little cost by a machine now or soon so it's yeah i mean you know, i mean maybe the arms race is between the pat the pattern recognition machines and uh our ingenuity in in uh temporarily escaping them before of course they you know they become patterns in themselves and becoming enclosed it it does seem to me though that the there is there is still a, a, a kind of fundamental ceiling that has bedeviled the, the kind of you know a lot of the the so-called service industries um, forever. I mean, this it, so much of the of the AI hype I mean comes out of I think decades of sort of frustration I think among a lot of uh, the the business elite about the the challenge of improving productivity and. And the services, and, and part of that is is a matter of the the kind of individual worker, you know, um, who you're you're paying a wage to, and so AI may solve that problem by making the worker indispensable. 
Um, but part of it is the, you know, the, the, the kind of symphony problem. You know, how do you, how do you make a, a, a symphony more, more productive? You know, at the end of the day, uh, the, uh, the a, a one, you know, <laughs> you, you can only consume, you know, one symphony per hour. It's, it's sort of, it's sort of baked in. So even if you have AI, you know, producing, <laughs> producing the symphonies there there still seems to be to me to be you know this kind of fundamental um it's it's kind of hard to there's a, a sort of fundamental demand ceiling for a lot of these these products um, that I, I i don't see ai you know breaking through in any way yeah so we have another round of the hype cycle where the claim is that productivity will increase and the suspicion is that it won't increase all that much and in this case, there isn't even the you know past productivity, you know past, past visions of of economic transformation. You know the 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 goal has been in some way to you know inspire inspire workers. I mean, there there's so much of of management theory in the last century in the United States is focused on cultivating a sense of kind of vicarious participation, identification. You know, being sort of uh, part of this kind of you know, revolutionary project, but the, of course, it's paradoxical in the case of AI, which you know seeks it seeks has that that kind of revolutionary selling point. But there, there aren't there aren't the the number of, of workers who may get a sense of kind of gratification out of participating in that in that project is very very small. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that I mean, another thing I saw this week was a widely mocked video by a CEO. I think she's the CEO of a of a furniture company. Uh, design company um kind of berating her workforce who she's she's cancelled all bonuses but taken a four million dollar bonus herself <laughs> and uh, the video is her sitting in her nice living room telling them you know to to kind of suck it up and think about the the team and think about the you know the company goals and so on and that the particular hollowness of that from from the person who hasn't shared in the sacrifice seems to exemplify the kind of hollowness that's at the the root of uh, of, of the disaffection from work culture and that there are these claims about self-actualization and there are these claims about uh being part of something and we're all a family and that could kind of you know the, the sort of stuff that management tends to say to workers to try and squeeze more work out of them and people find it increasingly hard to even pay lip service to that stuff since it's it's so you know i mean it's 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 just the sort of sugar coating of the exploitation there's there's nothing as wretched as a uh forced fun a kitchen birthday oh. someone's you know a co-worker oh ty, let's go to the kitchen let's have some cake let's pretend like this is not <laughs> awful <laughs> um but I wanted to, you know, uh, towards the end of your piece, Eric, you talk about uh, sort of like the possibilities that come after this, right? Where, you know, we could uh, possibly, you know, post-post-industrialization where perhaps, you know, we replace polluting technologies with green technologies and there, you know, the government has basically done nothing to encourage that uh, despite some good PR on their end. But, you know everything ends but the problems of work seem so antiquated and how could work possibly reconfigure itself to become legitimate again or is it just fundamentally it, it will never be legitimate because it sucks <laughs> well there's the question of of legitimacy which is a social fact and there's uh, a, a question of sort of worth worthiness uh you know in a, a more kind of uh objective sense um and I, I think it's worth distinguishing the two i mean it's it's certainly conceivable that that work becomes legitimate again in the social sense in that in that people you know feel their employers are kind of holding up their their end of whatever bargain seems to, seems to be made um you know that there that there there is a, a kind of that, that, that what they were doing is not just you know necessary or obligatory but, but worthwhile in, in some some fundamental sense you know the, the, the question of how you know how long that that sense will stick around I mean to me again that's why I think the the, the sort of appreciating the, the cyclical 
dynamic of of this history is is worthwhile. I mean, we we've we've been through we've been through this before. There there have been sort of past moments where the legitimacy of work has has come into question, and new you know projects, new new sorts of uh, frameworks for for making sense of um, the worthiness of of work have come onto the scene and, and gained traction. Um, so it's certainly conceivable to me that you know some, you know some sort of some <laughs> through some miraculous stroke of fortune there is a kind of national project to reorient the economy around decarbonization and everyone becomes you know, very enthusiastic about this and, and gets a sense of their of their work as kind of contributing to this ecologically indispensable uh, initiative. Um, but at some point, even if that does happen, the economy will be decarbonized. And, and so yeah. you're, you're, back at square, you're back at square one. So, I mean, I, I don't think that there, there is a formula to sort of re-legitimizing work from, from my own political perspective. I, I think that it's, you know, worth precisely for this reason, um, trying to imagine a, a, a horizon that would bring us out of this, this cycle. Um, though, you know, to, to date, it's, it's been hard to, to kind of get too much kind of concrete traction and, and uh, imagining exactly what that would look like. I, I mean, I think, I mean, that horizon is communization yeah. in, in some form. I mean, if, you know, we're talking about shared projects and the project of decarbonization, you know, we are all in it together. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. there is a, you know, a widely held legitimacy to that project. And, you know, I, I mean, the hollowness of the of the rhetoric of the CEO saying we're all in it together is that we know that we are not, that there are, most of us are on a wage and, you know, the owners are the owners. And so, uh, you know, the 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 way to to re legitimize work is for the common for common goals to be identified and the products to be shared and however you understand that politically and how whatever kind of social forms that you produce to embody that i i, I don't see that there's any other kind of way of of persuading people to in many many inverted commas buy in <laughs> um i know other than that I, you know genuine sharing and, uh, and and genuine shared goals. Yeah, and I, I think again, I mean, what I would argue is that it's it's worth aspiring to kind of re wedging this. You know, if 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 so much of what's what explains our our present culture of work is the erosion of a distinction between doing and and working, I think that uh, you know it's 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 important to recover a sense of of activity that's you know outside of work of of thinking of you know uh coming to to appreciate the, the sort of contingency of work as the the kind of catch-all category for um encompassing human activity uh and you know of course the 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 need to work for work for a wage for a living um you know will will fundamentally uh until we have moved moved past that necessity um there are there will, I think, always be um, that that kind of creep um, work. Uh, in mm, I think that's true, isn't it? I mean, we need to reconceptualize the old sort of industrial era. Um, you know, eight hours work, eight hours rest, eight hours for what you will, um, and in a kind of uh, collapse of those distinctions, we still need to carve out spaces for. I think this is a very important point you made. Yeah. The, activity that is not encompassed by work or understood through the lens of work so let's say let's say automation does actually wipe out 80 percent of the workforce so what happens to those people if there was a ubi would it actually level the playing field and create a fairer future or would it become like existing means tested programs a stigma, something that is, you know, of those people. I, th- I think it's firstly, it's it's uh, hugely threatening to, I mean, if you know, what power do workers have in uh, polit- political negotiations? It's the, the only credible threat is the withdrawal of your labor. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you're not laboring anyway, then you are more or less at the mercy of those who control productivity. They can decide the level of your UBI, whether you get the good UBI or the good enough UBI or the bad UBI. 
I mean, I, I, I think people will be incredibly reluctant to consign themselves to this space with, where they they don't have a, a, a right to representation. They don't have a right to uh, uh, and they don't have you know power in the most straightforward way. So I think it will be stigmatized because it will be frightening to be consigned to a position of powerlessness mm. and it'll be stigmatized, you know, it, that there will be good reasons not to want to be on it. Yeah, I mean, from my from my perspective, uh, a society where 80% of the population is rendered redundant and, you know, thrown on the on the mercy of the, the state or, you know, corporate benefactors, I mean that that either you know seeds seeds a, a kind of more fundamentally what, what yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know it's it's uh, either a, a pathway to a kind of dystopia of the sort that, that Hari just outlined or you know is is the, the kind of seedbed for a yeah more kind of revolutionary solution to the the problem. I mean, unless as a, unless as a kind of civilization we decide that we don't need to kind of maximize productivity. Yeah. You know that somehow our you know our yeah. goal or you know goals become fundamentally different yeah. um i mean i think that it's you know that, that's the only way you like let that kind of you know inverted commas leisure becomes dignified and becomes you know it, it you know it becomes activity that is not labor i think that it's worth remembering um as well that that something like this has actually already occurred um in that the you know in the in the mid in the late 19th century uh, well over 80% of the American workforce worked in, in agriculture. Um, mm. You know, you, you fast forward a few decades, um, you know, roughly 50% worked in, in industrial manufacturing. We have already undergone hi- historically a, a cycle of, you know, the, the work that uh, an enormous chunk of the, the population once did disappearing. Um, but rather than UBI, you know, this this problem was, the, the, the kind of social problem of, of uh, surplus population was, was solved. The, the development of new uh, industries, new new kinds of work that, that could absorb um, these people. And so I think that the, you know, when, when we think about the, you know, uh, work disappearing, you know, remember and, and kind of do, engaging in sort of prognosticating exercises i think it, it is worth remembering what what work disappearing in the past has looked like which is often the start of a new wave of, yeah. of work creation yeah we'll all be making a pyramid for yeah <laughs> right i mean it's in some sense the the apocalyptic version of the of the future is more comforting to imagine you know rather than this kind of endless cyclical repeti- repetition return to feudalism <laughs> Well, we are. I mean, we're back in the social relations of the Gilded Age. You know, the the flattening of the hierarchies that took place through the 20th century has been successfully reversed by the ruling class. Yeah. Why not? Why not just one step further and then we're back to living on the, the Lord's land and serving him? Yeah. <laughs> Be great. Um, well, thank you, guys. This was such an amazing conversation. Yeah, oh, thanks thank for you. having us on. You've been listening to the Harper's Magazine podcast. The music is Cut and Shoot by Febrifuge. Harper's Magazine is the oldest general interest monthly in America, exploring the issues that drive our national conversation through long-form narrative journalism and essays. To get 12 issues for $21.97, visit harpers.org save.